Welcome, everyone, to another Canadian Immigration Live q and I am Mark Holtley, Canadian Immigration Lawyer, and boy, do we have some stuff to talk about today. Thank you for tuning in. Remember, every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, we're live here answering your questions about Canadian immigration. So stick around. I teach a little bit, then we open up the floor to questions, and today is one of those days. Remember, Thursdays at 11 a.m., except this week, it's going to be on Friday. Alicia, one of the other immigration lawyers in my firm, has her live Q&A. And we're just about at the stage where I can take the technological um, training wheels off and allow Alicia to carry forward with her Q&A. But today is mine. And this has been going on for probably over four years. I, I can't remember how long, but I love it. It's what infuses me. And today was a busy day. So I got a few things I want to talk about with one of the new announcements, well, public releases that IRCC has made about modernization and improving improving client experience. And I know there's been other videos and uh, CIC News has posted something, but I want to give you my take because this morning I had an interview with um, a PhD candidate from Oxford who was studying the impact of artificial intelligence on processing of your immigration applications. So stay tuned for that. We're going to chat. Um, and then as always, once we get through a little bit of a teaching moment, I will definitely give a big shout out to everybody. I know you guys always look forward to that. And um, and so right off the bat, we've got Anitha. Hello. We've got Yun Chen up in Edmonton. Uh, we've got uh, Let's Go Can Official. Great to see you. And so many more. Juliana is down in Wyoming. So we'll do some more shout outs to all of those fine people who are connecting in. Uh, with our live stream today. I also want to announce that I'm super excited because I have a new video editor that is going to be helping to take the content, especially in these live Q and A's and to break it down into nice little bite sized bite sized pieces as I answer all of your immigration questions about Canadian immigration. So, uh, so stick around and make sure that you always go back and like, and subscribe the YouTube channel, because if you do that, um, you're going to see that there's going to be more and more videos that are being released that specifically cover um, little more bite-sized pieces about the questions you have and that you're asking me even today. Okay, so hold off on your questions. We'll we'll wait a couple more minutes for people to 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 connect in. But today I want to just shift very quickly over here. Let's see if we can pull this up. And I want to talk about this, which is the measures to improve client experience and modernize Canada's immigration system. So this is a way for, for IRCC to try to do some damage control. In other words, um, let's make sure we got our mic up high enough here. Yeah. So they're trying to do some damage control um, with the, the horrible track record that they've had over the last two years with processing times. And what I want to do is pull out just a few aspects of this that you might just quickly gloss over. So they've, once again, the backgrounder, it's been horrible, the pandemic, it's impacted processing. Um, before the pandemic, we even had a need to transform and modernize the system, which is to digitize it, make applications online. The government has prioritized the reduced, uh, the, to reduce waiting times and to improve client experience and transparency. So, I'll get to this in just a second, you guys, the transparency. But yes, as I've told you, they've they've dropped $85 million to help fund uh, uh, this, you know, climbing out of this processing problem. And they've already taken major steps to achieve these goals of getting the processing times under control. And what have they done? Those of you who are looking at PR through a number of different categories, they've rolled out the ability to file all of these suckers right here, all via the PR application portal. And I'm slowly slowly starting to move over, but I'll tell you right now, sponsoring spouse partner, I'm still filing via paper. And um, if you, uh, in the course that I had last week, uh, you'll remember that I launched um, the very, very first spousal sponsorship course and masterclass. Our next one is scheduled for March the 21st. So click here, reserve your spot and join. But um, let's get the right window here. But they've rolled this out so that you can even file H&C applications, which, man, I'll tell you, that's scary. There's only so much space that you have to upload documentation. And it just, yeah, it makes me really concerned that we're trying to wedge all of that into this PR portal. But anyways, so as they go forward, they can still, they say, they acknowledge, and I take advantage of this, that you can still apply on paper 
and the online options give some PR applicants more flexibility, blah, 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 blah. That's fine. They expect to expand in the summer uh, at, to as many permanent resident programs as probably are out there through the portal. And um, you can see they've also developed all those separate portals to allow people to finalize, like the landing portal that you use for your e-copers when you get that. And uh, they're looking as well at an online PR card um, without any in-person interaction. So um, yeah, so basically you're, you're going to physically declare you're in Canada and, and all of this information. That's fine. So from June uh, to 2021, they say they processed... Um, from June to December of 20, 2021, can you imagine this, you guys? 225,000 permanent residents have used the portal. And that's how they were able to reach that 401 target. Um, but they're just basically celebrating all of their successes. Look at us. We are doing all these amazing things and great things. And, you know, and I'm always a little bit concerned when the government feels they need to have to promote this and tell people how good they're doing when, in reality, you guys are suffering, Right. And so I have, I have issues with that, but government's all about, you know, controlling the narrative. And so then you look at the TR processing and you know, this is the thing that has absolutely astounded me. Most of you now realize, and I'm going to flip back here. Most of you now realize that studying in Canada is probably the pathway. And for many of you, getting that study permit, being able to come to Canada and study, may be your only pathway to Canada through the Federal Skilled Worker Program well, realistically, through one of the federal high skill programs, which includes CEC, FSW, and otherwise, um, <clears throat> because you need Canadian experience to get enough points to rank high enough because it's so competitive. And yes, the system is is just really in disarray. It's, it's really suffering. But I'll tell you, the demand for immigration to Canada has, has never waned. And when you look at the other, pro the other countries and the challenges that exist, some have programs that are fast track, but many of them are very, very similar to what we're seeing now with the delays and everything else. But I don't need to tell you that. All of you guys know that. Um, but when I go back here and we look at this, it is absolutely crazy. You know, I remember when there were less than 200,000 study permit um, uh, candidates in the country, and it wasn't that many years ago. But now, following a record year for study permits in 2019, pre-pandemic, IRCC increased their output 32% during the pandemic by finalizing almost 560,000 study permit applications. Whoa, whoa, stop the bus, okay? Let's take a very careful look at what they're saying here. They are saying they finalized almost 560,000 study permit applications. I think you guys know that finalized is not the same word as approved. And finalized doesn't mean that's how many students were actually able to come to Canada. And how many of you students out there uh, took, in good faith, the step of starting your studies outside of Canada, paying the outside of Canada um, tuition fees to start your program in Canada only to see your application get refused? And why? All right, let's take a look at this. And I sure hope people are talking about this, and I don't think they are. Everybody's talking about the fanfare and how many numbers and blah, blah, blah. But you have to re read through the lines. They continue to prioritize study and work. They've started to handle new visitor visa applications. Finally, now that vaccinated visitors can enter Canada. Two, and here it is, you guys, to address its accumulated inventory of visitor visa applications. Oh, it is not just visitor IRCC is expanding the use of advanced data analytics in helping IRCC officers sort and process visitor visa applications submitted from outside Canada. They're already using this stuff for study permit applications. Those of you who are seeing your applications in India and China and Africa, and well, I'm not sure how widespread the use of Chinook is, but this is the issue, okay? And you can see here, they're trying to frame the narrative. Advanced data analytics has been used since 2018 to help sort and process TRV applications from countries where there is a high volume. If you have a high volume, know that they've used something like this. And you can see here, it has been shown that routine files can be assessed 87% faster using the system. Yes, and it also helps to expedite refusals, which is also something they haven't alerted us to here. 
So it results in some applicants receiving decisions more quickly while program integrity is maintained. Well, the reality is, of course, they're going to make sure that there isn't fraud and they're going to do what they can to curtail that. But the reality is the way they're using systems like Chinook, it is resulting in a, a substantial number, a number that's not insignificant of just errors, refusals that, that are not correct in law. And you can see here, the technology assumes a significant portion of clerical and repetitive tasks related to sorting applications, which allows IRC officers to focus their attention on assessing applications and final decisions. Now, I, am, I wanted to point that out because this is IRCC trying to explain how the use of these sorting tools like Chinook, and those of you who do not know what Chinook is, um, I did two previous videos with Will Tao. I did an interview with a PhD candidate in Oxford just this morning. It was almost two hours talking about the research she's doing um, with the impact of artificial intelligence um, on individuals um, in the context of immigration processing. And so it was a great conversation and there's lots of really, really super bright um, <clears throat> immigration lawyers who are who are tackling this, like Mario Bellissimo, Will Tao, um, um, Lou, uh, LJ as well. And um, and it's just, it's amazing to see the, the spin that immigration is putting on this. Now, as you look here, they emphasize IRCC officers make the final decision all visitor visa and only IRCC officers can refuse an application. The system never refuses or recommends refusing applications. The use of advanced data analytics is part of the IRC's commitment to find new ways to improve our client service and processes. It will assist in managing IRCC's increased volume of visitor visa applications going forward. I agree with these things. I agree with the fact that it will help new ways to, I'm going to skip improved client service. Because what does that mean? If it's just about speed of processing, um, I'm not sure if that's doing a favor to people um, getting a fast refusal um, and processes. And you can see here increase, it'll help to increase um, managing the applications. So what all of this means, you guys, is that they are now using tools um, that they are not classifying as artificial intelligence because they are saying that there is a human that is clicking refuse. But I'm not going to waste time this morning because I want to get to questions, but I want to direct you back to something that I think is an absolute travesty and you guys need to do this and, and, and I'm going to slide over here and I'm going to go over here right here and if you go to the videos, you will see if you scroll down here, I've got quite a few videos. Let me see if I can find Lou here. Um, da, 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 da. This has been a while. When did I meet with, uh, with, um, sorry, Will Tao, uh, Chinook, catching the Chinook. I've got so many videos here. I thought I'd just be able to easily, oh, here it is right here. Okay. So this one here, um, this should have 160,000 views, not 16. And, and this, this right here, how your visa gets refused update on the IRCC Chinook system is, is what it's called. Well, Will Tao, and I'm going to go back over here to this YouTube channel right now, um, LJD Law, Heron Law Offices, they are just getting started. They're, they're, um, they're, they, you know, really, really doing a lot of great, great work. And you, it, it's a travesty that there are only 266 subscribers on here. I know they've got their podcast as well, but you guys absolutely have to get over here and subscribe to this channel. And I want you to go back, <clears throat> excuse me, and I want you to watch two episodes this one right here that they did with uh, Zainab, um, just brilliant young lawyers who, you, you know, you guys, if you're not watching this, you are missing out. And I want to point out as well, this recent updated one that happened just, um, I think, in December. This one is, a, is, is an excellent one where they actually bring on, I think, Mario Bellissimo um, into this, who is one of the, the leading immigration lawyers talking about AI. And so why am I saying all of this? Why am I pointing you to all of this? Because when you're applying for study permits, visitor visas, work permits, you have to understand the why. And I say this repeatedly. You have to understand 
why immigration is asking a specific question in the application forms. And when you understand the why, you can then know the what. What you're going to put into those forms. Because more than ever before, the information you put into the forms, I'm not talking about letters of explanation. I'm not talking about other information you're putting in the applications, which we as immigration lawyers pride ourselves on. This information is not being thoroughly reviewed by officers at the front end when they are processing, at this stage, these temporary resident applications. When they talk about the use of, of sorting tools, those tools are used to pull out information that the intake officer feels are essential components to then triage applications into tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three. I don't know how many tiers there are. Maybe tier one is this expedited approval. You hit all the check boxes. Tier two is maybe there's something, yeah, we're not sure. So we're going to need to send it to an officer to decide whether or not they're going to refuse. And every tier you get sorted into, your chances of getting your application refused are astronomically increased. And so you must Pay attention to this stuff, especially those of you who are thinking about doing um, filing for study permits. And, and that's why, at least within the firm, we have really shifted to now supporting international students in their journey. You cannot rely on um, your representative to just do your whole application for you without you being directly involved in it. It takes your knowledge, your understanding, your background to be able to create a package, to create an application that is really JR proof, essentially. It's, 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 it's a package that covers every single thing that immigration is looking for so that if, an, if this Chinook system triages you to a, a tier two and the officer doesn't even look at your detailed explanation, uses the, the, detail, the, you know, the information that's put into one line in this big spreadsheet of 100 people at the same time, um, you can judicially review that to save your chance of immigrating to Canada. And that's really what it has come down to. Reconsideration, good luck with that. Maybe they're infusing a prior visa refusal, which I suspect, as a negative factor that is going to cause your application, your second one, to automatically be, be triaged back down to tier two. So we'll get into this a lot more. Um, Zara, who was their guest, um, is has been, you know, she does just a, a ton of study permits and she works a lot within her, her um, I think it's the Iranian community, I can't remember, but uh, just a bright, bright young lawyer and great insight. And I'm going to have her come, but she is slipping away uh, for, for a maternity leave for a little bit. So she'll be back in April. And I'm hoping that in a little over a month, I'll be able to have her join and share her insight on tips and strategies. But these are all things now that many of you are having to pay attention to because never before has the, you know, the, the, the importance of a study permit fit into the picture of express entry. It was important before, but coming to Canada, finding a way here may be many of your only ways of getting here. So um, remember, anytime you need any help or assistance, you can go over to our website and book a consultation with all of us. Through the month of January, I bumped my rate up to $400 an hour, uh, well, $400 for a 25-minute consult because I needed to get through the spousal course and a bunch of other things. And it seems like that's the only way I can kind of encourage, uh, you know, uh, well, take on consultations in a, in, a, in, a, in a manageable way. But I've dropped that down to 300 again. And uh, you can literally go and book consultations right now with any of our lawyers just by, by clicking on book a consult on the main page. Okay. All right. And we would love to collaboratively review your applications with you. Okay. I know that we've got a lot of things that we're talking about today, but I, I wanted you to understand that this is something you have to learn. You No longer can you rely on your agent, your education agent, or whoever to just put your application and throw it together, you know, especially the lower you pay. And, and I know it, you know, this shouldn't work this way, but you do get what you pay for. And when you're paying someone $100 to help you file, $100 Canadian to help you file a study permit application, my goodness, they are going to be, they're going to be trying to get through it as fast as they can. And especially firms that push down um, the application, the actual preparation of the application to the lowest paid unit within that firm to, to maximize profits, whether it's a law firm, a consulting firm or whatever, the reality is if you are not intricately just 
like completely integrated in that process, your application is never going to be as strong as it could be without you being involved. So in the firm, we teach you why so that collectively we can make sure the what is exactly, you know, what you put in there is, is something that's going to, that's going to give you the greatest chance of, uh, of success. Okay. So there we go. Let's see who else we have here. So we do have one, our first little chat here that got thrown up pretty quick. Um, Tamea said, submitted my EAPR on January the 10th for express entry with AI and P. Okay. Uh, in your opinion, what is the minimum or and maximum processing time for COPA right now? Are PNP outline immigrant, uh, immigrants also considered priority for RCC? So right now, spouses rank above the economic, but because of the way they are triaging applications, and we don't know to what extent they're doing it in the context of PR yet, but we suspect it's starting to move that direction. Applications that can be easily approved are going to get approved faster, and they've said this in the processing times, than applications that they feel are more complex. In other words, maybe, and we don't know to what extent, like I said, Chinook is being you know, incorporated into the permanent resident process. It's coming. If it's not there, it's coming. And so people that have very clean cut applications are, are going to get processed faster. Those that are not are going to get then triaged to another, you know, more detailed uh, examination, hopefully. Um, but that's, that's a reality. Now I just finished, um, Let's see, what's today? Wednesday. Yesterday, I had a meeting with the new acting director of the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program. We talked about the tech pilot. We talked about a number of things going on with the pilot programs, the Alberta Opportunity Stream, the Express Entry Stream. And in December, some of you may have got a notification of interest and you were not in Canada. But because of your occupations and where they landed, and I'm going to do a video, I'm going to do a um, I'm going to, uh, probably not a live stream, but I think I'm going to record a video specifically on the ins and outs of the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program, at least the current state of the world, and how this all fits together. If you are a postgraduate work permit holder in Canada that is uh, working within the tech sector in any capacity, if you can find an employer in Alberta in the tech industry that's willing to hire you, Yes, indeed, you have a pathway to permanent residence where you may not have one waiting for CEC to come around anytime soon. Yes, it takes a little bit of time, but it's an employer-driven process. But your open post-grad work permit, you know, work permits, same thing for spousal open work permits. Those work for the purposes of Alberta, but the employer needs to be in Alberta and you need to be there. So come to my province. If you have questions, book a consult. I'm happy to explain it. All right. So that was a good, good question. Great way to start it off, Tamea. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we've got Man, uh, uh, Mantre, who is, or Mantre, who's from India. Great to have you here. Jam is in South Africa. Um, oh, CF is in, in Burkina Faso. Thank you for connecting in. Uh, Mama, hello to you. Uh, oh, my goodness, Sabia. Oh, can you, oh, what temperature is it here? Minus 32 and feels like minus 38. Okay, let's see. I know it's cold. I was quite cold last night. So it's, it's minus 22 right here. You can see in, um, in, in Lethbridge where I live. <clears throat> yes, it is cold. Oh, my brother-in-law is coming to borrow uh, my ice fishing shelter to, uh, to take some of the young men in our church in his congregation out ice fishing on Saturday. So they'll very, very, uh, they'll be very, very happy to have my, my insulated igloo pop-up ice shelter. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Ami, I am definitely positive today. It was really good to meet with that professor and to that, that PhD candidate and just help her in her research. Love it. Uh, divine. Good to see you. Um, doing great Sanjay. Good to see you over in India. George is in the house. One of my alumni. I love it when you guys connect in and say hello. Rashid's in London. Um, uh, uh, Notion, XY Notion is Dakar. Great to have you over from Senegal. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> there's a question. Is it okay to have multiple express entry provosts to suit different provinces? Well, the reality is when it comes to uh, uh, provinces, I would strongly discourage you from, from submitting multiple express entry profiles. Um, there, I'm trying to think of there's, if, if you've got a, a, a husband and a, and a wife, if you've got spouses, 
then absolutely each of you should have uh, separate profiles initially to increase your chances. But multiple profiles, I'm not sure um, how that would uh, provide much advantage unless you were trying to strategize and use um, your uh, knock codes from different work experiences in the past 10 years as your primary knock so that they're caught by any provinces looking to extend um, uh, notifications of interest to you. So, but uh, yeah, that's something I would definitely, uh, very rare situation would I encourage anyone to do that. Um, Lenel is Kuwait. Good to see you. Um, yes. And Camille says lots of PNP FSW. Yes. They're processing, they're pushing those updates. Not much of CEC outland. Why is that? Thank you. You know what? I think that's anecdotal, Camille. I think people are experiencing different things. I think they're working through the process. It's not like they're ignoring you. Um, I think literally they're working through the process. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's hilarious. Welcome from the Shire. There you go. Okay. Once someone gets an AOR, does the biometrics under tier to PR, what are the next steps that RG takes? Thanks. Well, once you, um, once you get the AOR and you do the biometrics, then anything could happen. If there's something missing, you could get a request letter and uh, um, for, for uh, additional documents or updates or things like that. Um, you could very well get confirmation that they're, they're ready to move forward and finalize your application. And uh, it just depends on how complete your application was. Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, we've got... Uh, Satyaki is over in Toronto. Good to see you. Uh, let's jump down to some of our, we'll get caught up on the super chats here. Okay. So Manthre says 26 with active EE profile, CRS 471. Yeah. Accountant or auditor, no job offer or Canadian experience. Not sure if any problems accepts non-tech HR profiles, what to do other than, than wait for NOI. Um, uh, question did not show up in the message. Okay. Got it. I think we, I think we, we, I think we covered that off. So basically, um, uh, uh, Mantra, this is this is one of the situations that we're struggling with. Now, twenty six is not too old. So it's obviously, you know, when you've got when you already have an accounting designation, sometimes it's it's tricky to then apply for something to go to school in Canada. But you do have room potentially to do a master's or something like that. Um, so so that's a possibility. But ultimately, at 471, it's going to be a long time before the, the, the rounds of invitations get down to that level. I think it's going to be quite challenging. Um, in most cases, uh, the, the kind of the accountant auditor knock code is, is not often in demand in provinces across the country. So um, I recommend, really, I recommend that you book a consult and that we are able to actually look at your situation in detail. Okay, that's what I recommend. Okay. Now let's zip through here. I know we've got so many questions that just come um, come flipping through here. Uh, Sim says, what is a flag polling? That's basically when you need to apply for a work permit <clears throat> and it's your first work permit and um, uh, you then go down and you present yourself to the U.S. at the land crossing and you say, look, I'm not looking to come to the U.S. I'm just applying for a Canadian work permit. Uh, and so I'm just looking to turn around. So the idea is you're looping around the flagpole, which is the flag of Canada. You're looping around and coming back in to present yourself because to apply, you have to have left Canada and then be applying on entry. So that's what flag polling is. Um, okay. Uh, Joe David says there, nice to see you live. What about visitor visa on new portal processing times waiting for sun has more than two years. It's an absolute disgrace. Um, in this case, uh, uh, Joe, I recommend that you book a consult. We'll need to dig into that deeper, but this has never been like over, the, it's never been processing times this long. It's just terrible. And as, as I indicated earlier, um, that they're working on processing visitor visas, but it's very slow because they rank lower than all of that backlog permanent residents. And, um, and, you know, and it's so hard because in your case, you're saying you're waiting for your son and husband more than two years. I'm not sure where you are at in the PR processing, if they're included as a company with your application or, or where you're at, but yeah, I feel for you. Um, yeah, and so Sanjay and others that are asking about, hey, how do I immigrate? Book a consult. I ring the bell, and uh, and basically I want you to slide over to here and click on speak to a lawyer and and book a consult, and we can go into that in depth. Okay, let's see what's next. Um, uh, okay, hi, I'm in the Philippines. My name is Princess. Princess, thank you so much. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm really excited with with uh, with Phil. I just hired my new video editor. 
Okay, uh, George says, can you confirm that moving... Oop, let's pull him up. Can you confirm that moving to Quebec as a PR will not disqualify me from getting the citizenship? I got PR through CAC without provincial nomination, so I'm not being mean to any province. <laughs> George, you're a permanent resident. You can make whatever decisions you want. The charter authorizes you to be able to move and live in any province that you want. If you want to move to Quebec, it will not impact negatively your citizenship application in any way. All right, great question, my friend. And if you, those of you who are tuning in, um, tuning in kind of late to the game, if we slide over here and we go to the Express Entry course, which is going to be launching this month, um, I'm going to I'm going to do a pre-launch and just see how many people are interested in um, in actually uh, going through the the program right now. I know there's a lot of PNPs that are out there, and the Express Entry this program will help you with that last uh, that last step. But when you go here, if you scroll down to the bottom. And you see all of the past people that have taken this. I think, George, I think you're still on here. Um, da, 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 do we, yeah, right here. So there's George right there. This course is worth a lot more than $400. I would have needed to book 10 consults to ask all the questions I had. Some questions emerge as you listen to others. So definitely recommend this course while it is available. So, George, you've, you've been so faithful, so supporting. And thank you so much, my friend. Um, yeah, good luck with everything. Good luck. Okay, we got another chat in here. Okay, so the next one, uh, oh, I'm going to have to pull up this. Make sure that you get that the question in there. Um, okay, here we go. So Amrit says, this is awesome. I love this question. <laughs> Big applause. He says, do we need to mention previous refusals as a minor? And then we'll put this in here, the follow-up. I have never mentioned in my... In my all applications, do I need to mention in pure application? Amrit, 100% the answer is yes. It doesn't say only disclose refusals after you turn the age of 18. So Amrit, right from the beginning, you should have disclosed all of that. And failing to disclose it can be seen as misrepresentation carrying with it a five-year bar from Canada. I've seen it happen time and time again. And when it comes to the actual artificial intelligence, well, the triaging system, the sorting tool that IRCC uses, um, if this thing is going to grow to the, uh, to the point where it has the ability to, to map very closely what you say in your forms with your immigration history so that these kinds of things are not missed. Now, I'm assuming that your refusal happened maybe to another country, um, maybe the U.S., and it's not always as easy to track those refusals for minors, but there will be a time where they will be able to see everything and they will, they will destroy the lives of people who innocently forget or don't realize that they needed to include that type of a refusal and acknowledgement of it in the application. And so, um, yes, it's something that I definitely would be concerned about, Amrit. And once again, I recommend that you book a consult to sort out exactly the best way of dealing with it. But 100%, do I need to mention in PR application? Absolutely 100% yes, but it's not that simple. You also need to address the fact that it was omitted in previous applications. And I've helped people, um, you know, I've helped people uh, respond to procedural fairness letters where this has come up as a, as a concern. And um, it can get really messy fast and the consequences are disastrous after you've spent so much time potentially in Canada all, to see it all disappear just because um, you didn't understand what the question was really asking. Do you see where I'm getting? We teach within our firm the why. We teach the why so that you know the what. All right, let's go to the next one here. Um, okay, so who's up? Natasha is. She says, what are the current processing times for ICT visas under GSS category? Do they do they have a similar timeline as other work permit applications? You know what? They are supposed to be fast. But um, what we're seeing now is that these are often, even in the best of circumstances, two to three months. So some come back quicker depending upon the location. I don't know where you're at, Natasha. But, um, but it's not uncommon for us to see two to three months processing. And um, yeah, and, and potentially even more in some cases. We have seen some kind of slip through and come through quicker. <clears throat> but depending upon the country, an intercompany transfer is not easy, especially if you're coming in as a specialized knowledge worker and you have to show that there, you know, that you have um, uh, advanced level of knowledge in a proprietary, you know, uh, you know, um, something that's idiosyncratic to that company. 
you know, where the, the, that experience and, 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 um, and training and education is not, that knowledge is not readily available in Canada and you have to prove that. And that's one of the more difficult ICTs to, to approve, whether it's under GSS or anything, especially, you know, even more so than, than the, the senior managerial or executive level. So that's one of the complexities, Natasha, is that these are not an easy, straightforward. It requires a lot of uh, examination by a real officer. And when they're trying to triage things, that's, that's, uh, that's definitely going to get referred to, to, to look at by, by an officer. Okay, Jace is applied through TR to PR. Uh, Bank Teller, can I change my job to any other job, not on the TR to PR eligible knock list, while my PR application is in process? Yeah, Jay, you can do whatever the heck you want. For TR to PR pathway, all you have to do is make sure that you're in valid status at the time in which your application is approved. So there's no problem at all with you um, taking the step of, of um, uh, switching jobs or doing whatever you like, okay? All right, let's see what else we got here. Um, Ba, 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 ba. Let's see. We've got, I think we're, uh, we've got uh, Simis in South Africa. Uh, Shreya says, any news for students who is losing their status and when are they coming up with perfect solutions? As Mr. Fraser said, <coughs> I just finished. We worked through the weekend, uh, the pen holders on our submission. Big shout out to them uh, within the CBA to provide a response to Minister Fraser on what he should do. And obviously the answer is pretty clear, you guys. He needs to extend that 18-month, you know, policy um, under under his humanitarian and compassionate authority. He needs to extend the postgrad by another 18 months for people not otherwise captured by the previous one. So at the very least, I think that's what they need to do open season. But I personally am advocating for a return to um, the ad exempt LMIA for postgrad work permit holders, where you guys can actually get 50 points for your job offer, and the employer, as long as they're paying the pre- paying the prevailing wage rate, which might be a little higher than you're paying right now uh, as a student, um, where they can um, uh, they can actually apply for a labor market impact assessment without advertising, and that used to be on the books uh, back in um, 2014. It was it was closed, so that's kind of what I'm. You know, that's what I'm advocating for. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, CF says, I was part of the last draw on the 23rd of December. Wow. Okay. Just want to know what is going on with our applications. Well, it just depends, my friend. So so you can see, if you look at what's happening, they are actively working hard to try to cull this backlog. And so I think we saw in the, the memoranda that that they were they were quoting about 20 months processing for FSW applications um, back in November. But since that time, they they injected 85 million into it. Uh, in my discussion with Minister Fraser, he said that you know they're having trouble finding officers. And and let's face it, it you can't just step off the street and become an officer who understands all the intricacies of immigration and start adjudicating applications. It doesn't work that way. It takes time to get people up to speed. And just like other businesses in Canada who are struggling to find workers, and yes, that wave is coming. Those of you who are looking for job offers and opportunities, that wave is coming as Canada re- regroups and rebuilds. Our industries are expanding and as this lockdowns disappear and as the pandemic goes away, finally, then there will be job offers available for people to come and work, not just try to go through the student route. Um, but um, but yes, that's what we're advocating for. And um, and so... Yeah, the, the, the last draw in, for, in terms of, of, uh, of, of timing, um, I expect that most of the people that are legacy way back then are going to see things moving forward um, by mid-year. So, but realistically, most of you, a lot of people are seeing action on their files right now. Okay, Washi, great to have you here from Rwanda. Thanks for connecting in. Legit 90s is from Cambridge. Hello. And uh, Mentre, I think we said uh, hello to you already here. Um, okay, so then Jobin says, is flag polling a good option for post-grad work permit to save four months of processing times? Jobin, I never, ever advise people to go down to the border. And I work there. There's just so much that can go sideways, including that gap. And this is where I will go back to our firm website and I'll show you guys to go to the resource section blog. And, and uh, Alicia did a... If, if you have not read this blog, get your keister over there and read it. Because in here, you can see all the different topics that we have. Um, she did one uh, last year when we saw what was happening with the students. Um, let's see here. 
just got to find it. I've got so many. I probably passed by. Okay, here we go. Can students be working after the end of their studies? This one right here, Alicia talks about in this nice little table that she has here, um, whether you can work or whether you can't and at what stage you have to stop working and what stage you can. And what we see here is there's this little space here. I know this is small, but it says when students receive transcript or official letter or email from school that the program is complete, they cannot work at all until they filed their post-grad work permit. And what happens, my friend, is when individuals go down to the border, those border officers are not there to facilitate. They get irritated when people do that. They don't like it. So what do they do? They look for every opportunity to refuse. And often those students then, there might be a gap. Maybe they, work, maybe they worked while they were studying 21 hours or 22. The officer looks at the phone. They discover that, oh, you were non-compliant. You worked outside of the confines of your study. Or maybe that student had a semester off or something and the officer goes back and does the calculations. I've seen it over and over again and say, oh, you didn't comply with your terms of maintaining student status during this period of time. Therefore, I'm going to um, not only refuse to process your study permit, uh, sorry, your work permit, your postgrad work permit, <clears throat> but I'm going to um, direct you uh, to depart Canada. I'm going to allow you to withdraw your application and leave. Otherwise, I'm going to take enforcement action against you. And that is what's waiting for people at the ports of entry. Now, ultimately, um, this is what people, whether they're postgrads, whether they're LMIAs, whether they're whatever they're applying for, that is the risk that you take when you're going to the border. And how do I know, my friends? It's because I was one of those officers in a previous life. Good question, Jobin. Okay, I'm not sure if we got any other chats. I'm trying to stay up to speed with those. Okay. Um, okay. So we've got to hit Harry here. Make sure to put your comment in there. Then I can see it. Okay. Harry says, I'm waiting for PR response on tier and PR healthcare stream. How long this process takes? Harry, that is the million dollar question. I'm going to say for you mid year, you should have a response. It should be going forward, but those applications are not just quickly refused. They are giving you guys opportunities to correct imperfections in the application. And I've done watched those videos in the past um, on TR to PR uh, talking about how officers are, uh, the, the actual policy instructions that they're being given on how they're to treat uh, the processing when documents are missing. But, um, but that's why it's taking so long. It's because of uh, IRCC's um, decision to not... Uh, you know, follow through with the R10 check, but instead to, um, like they do with express entry and just refuse, but instead to, they, they go out of their way to try to really to save applications, which takes a lot longer to process. Okay. Um, and then we've got, okay, Amir says, international student from Matera. I've been working part-time during the last two years in one startup. The company is growing. They gave me a very good job. Due to labor shortage, they need me as a full-time worker for that position. Can I apply work permit in this, in this case? Okay, so you are, um, as, as, you, as an international student, if you're still in school, um, no. You, you will, there's nothing causing, nothing stopping you from transitioning and actually moving from a student status to a worker status. But is that something that you want to do? Um, I don't think it is. And as far as applying for um, a work permit, you can't, it, it's hard I don't want to get into the complexities of, of, of federal court cases and the case law associated with this, but it is a rare situation where they're going to say, sure, we'll, we'll approve a work permit for you, an LMIA-based work permit, because um, that's what the employer would need to do, um, and also allow you to maintain your studies and work full-time and go to school full-time. And, and it's a very rare situation. I just do not think it would fly, and I don't know your situation fully, I recommend that you book a consult so we can talk about it because I'm always leery to, to give direction, individual direction that isn't just general information beneficial to everyone. Um, I just think you have to be really careful and um, without knowing more and how you're planning to do this, uh, that's probably all that I can offer, okay? Uh, let's see what's next here. Okay, I'll go back and... Uh, See if we can get back into the questions again. Um, and I apologize if I miss people. Remember, I'm going to be going live with Alicia tomorrow. Um, 
Uh, Tanush says, uh, been watching your channel from a long time. Thanks for all that you do for us. You're very, very welcome. I'll give you an applause. Um, my postgrad is expiring in August and was planning to apply for CEC in February. Any good news for us? At this stage, it's still uncertain. One thing I do know, and I've told you guys this before, uh, the Minister of Immigration has indicated clearly that there will be um, some, that, like they will resume draws this year. And so what it looks like, we're just not certain. Um, but I think you're, you're in a better situation in August. And one of the things that we're hoping, at least with our submission to immigration, that they will, um, they will reinstate the 18-month policy and reset the start and, and, and end date for it so that people that are caught in your situation waiting for CEC are not going to be um, harmed because of it. So that's, that's my view on that. Um, <clears throat> okay, this is a great question, Noor. Great question. Great to see you again. Um, we know that the OINP is really struggling with the, uh, with the ranges. And um, we know that they're kind of targeting the 460s still, right? And the reality is, um, it's, it's kind of goofy that, you know, if you have scores of 520, that you're not getting drawn through the OINP. Uh, but instead, they've arbitrarily kind of selected this range. Now, why is the range selected that way? It's because the lowest score used to be, was it 468, I think, under the um, no program specified draw. I think it dropped down to 468 at one point in time when they did those series of 5,000, 5,000, 5,000 uh, no program specified draws, uh, you know, that ended on the 23rd of December in, in 20, uh, 2020. Uh, yes, all the years are blurred together. It's hard to believe it's 2022. So um, with the AINP, when I had my discussions with them, remember, they don't really care about that stuff. As long as you're above 300, there isn't really a range. You could have 500, you could have, you know, 301. They treat you the same as long as you're in that category of, of you know, do you have a job offer uh, in Alberta? How, do you have Canadian um, post-secondary education? Do you have family in Alberta? Do you have, you know, French language ability, which is on the list that they describe? So, um, yeah, so I, I guess that's the issue. The OINP is struggling with this, and I think it's just us talking and, you know, them having a chance to see how things shake down. But I think the OINP should be increasing that um, for all the people like you who are in a situation where, you know, there, in, there are no draws, so do one that, that scoops out everybody above a certain level. But the problem is there's so many. So by selecting just a range, then they can limit the number of people that are they're extending notifications of interest to um, and uh, because they have a finite number and the, the PNPs have not yet received their their allocation for the year um, okay dev I'm gonna definitely ring the bell here and recommend that you book a consult um, uh, anything about medical inadmissibility like this is not something they'll be able to answer in the context of a live stream okay um, Okay, Susan says, I'm planning to bring my 22-year-old son there. Assist, please. Well, once again, ring the bell, book a consult, and we can sort that out. Um, okay, Denzel, uh, this is another question. Can an international student apply for full-time jobs before he applied for postgrad? Well, you can apply, right? You can, you can apply for a full-time job. There's no problems with that, but the, you can't start work full-time until you have applied for your postgrad work permit subject to all other admissibility, uh, you know, eligibility factors. Okay. Um, same thing, Raj Paul, book a consult. Um, yep. Once again, I'll ring the bell for you, Dev. Book a consult. Deep says, I got my visa for January 22 intake, but college defer for September. Yes. What can be done in this case? Any ideas, please suggest. Um, yeah, that is really, really tricky. Once again, Deeps, I recommend that you book a consult. These types of specific questions it depend on so many factors. Like, where are you now? Um, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to college and getting those deferrals, um, you know, when does your visa expire? So you've got your visa for the 2022 intake, but the, the you've now been deferred to September. Well, you know, what's the expiry in your visa? So there's a lot more information um, that, that we'll need. And so I recommend once again that you guys slide over here and, and just speak to a lawyer up here in the top 
and it will take you right to this easy spot where you can book a consult right now. And all of us right now, because Express Entry is, um, we're not seeing the rounds of invitations, um, we have a lot more capacity for consultation. So you'll see a lot more availability. So definitely head over there. Um, okay, Ahmed, I think many people want Canada immigration. Olu, hello, good to see you. Uh, Sadanth says, can I get my open work permit TRV stamped outside Canada, India? I applied under within Canada option, but I have to leave early because of family emergency. Can't wait for passport request. Um, you would have to notify them. Uh, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm just wondering here, can I get my open work permit stamped outside Canada, India? Um, I have to think about this. Uh, I'm operating on about four hours sleep last night. I was up preparing, reading, watching, um, you know, studying as much as I could on, on the Chinook system for my interview with the PhD uh, candidate. And so my brain is not as crisp as it usually is. So um, you've submitted your application from within Canada. When you submit applications from within Canada, they have to be processed inside Canada. So it, it will, you know, but but the TRV the actual visa imprinted in your passport. I'm not sure if you've applied through, cause it's really two separate processes. Um, if you applied within Canada, um, did you, you, did you apply for the actual TRV and um, you know, before you've left and in those circumstances, Sinanth, I really recommend you book a consult. There's too many moving parts here and you can see how hard I struggle when people ask specific questions that, because when you're saying, what do I do personally? Um, that's really legal advice. And uh, and that's why I, I hit the triangle and recommend that you slide over and book a consult so that we can actually get the information we need to give you advice. And facts are everything. Circumstances are everything with, with kind of the description and, and what I describe. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, silence. <laughs> that's an interesting, uh, interesting tagline there. Um, submitted application 1st of June, 2021. So relatively recently, biomedicals completed, medicals pending. Should I submit medical form from my side or wait for instructions from IRCC? My file's under E through OIMP. I would wait at this stage. I would wait. We just don't know where things are at. So I would recommend, uh, recommend that you wait. Um, <clears throat> okay. So Jamal says the minister had clarified in his communication that they expect to process 147,000 PR files during the first quarter of 2022. Entirely possible. Um, based on this, when, in your opinion, will IRCC end with the PR backlog? I think by mid-year is what they're projecting. So that's what I believe is is right around mid-year is is when they're targeting, um, you know, that, that that's when they're going to be getting through the backlog. Uh, okay, Veda says, Quebec Arima and EE Prof at the same time. Okay, I can tell you, Veda, any time we have two applications like that going at the same time, which have differing expectations in terms of what you have to demonstrate, never, ever, ever would I encourage that. Quebec-based, you have to demonstrate an intention to live in the province of Quebec when you submit your application. With express entry, you've submitted your profile, technically can sit there. But when you ultimately get an ITA <clears throat> and you submit that, then you have to demonstrate an intention to live outside of the profit, province of Quebec. And if you've already submitted an application to Quebec for permanent residence, well, how do you disabuse the officer of the logical conclusion that you do have an intention to reside in Quebec? So it becomes kind of messy. So Veda, I, I actually would recommend, you know, that you be very careful with that. If you've got the Quebec arena in already, and you've submitted your profile, you know, it's it's going to be tricky. And really, realistically, it's possible, I guess, to do it. But I encourage, I, I strongly discourage my clients from from having two applications, applications, like I, I mean, permanent resident applications, not just profiles, two in the queue that have contradictory um, expectations. Okay. All right. Good question. Thank you, Veda. And good to see you. Long time follower. Big shout out to you. Okay. So once again, every time I answer those super chats, then I, I have to go back and just start somewhere in the feed. So I don't always go back to where I was before. So um, yeah. 
Okay, let's see. So if I missed you, I apologize. And then another chat comes through. Okay, why are you advocate non-advertised LMI way to extend work permit for people who are already in Canada and their work permit expired due to no CEC draw? Uh, because just because there's a CEC draw, Toya, does not mean that you are going to have the comprehensive ranking system points to receive an ITA. Simple as that. And I'm not adv advocating for, for either or. The reality is I think they should do both. And I think people who are working for an employer in Canada on a valid post-grad work permit <clears throat> that is not yet expired, <clears throat> then absolutely the policy can help to save. If someone in your situation, if they're out of status, their work permit has expired, then an LMIA can actually allow you to restore your status and get back into the, the queue. Now, maybe the post-grad, we've advocated that they have wider parameters to allow people to restore their status during a period of time if they've fallen out of status using whatever, an 18-month or whatever range they do for the post-grad work permit. But, but the reality is when it comes to LMIAs, if it's issued, you can get another 50 points, which makes you more competitive. Yes, the employer still has to pay a $1,000 processing fee, but they don't need to show that they, you know, that, that there's no Canadian or permanent resident. Yes, maybe they would need to show that they're paying the prevailing wage rate, which would be probably higher than you're paying, but that's 50 points for you. And it assures the government that, yeah, this person actually does have an employer who's supporting them and it gives them greater assurance of your ability to settle. So that's why, and that's a good question there, jet lag. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right, let's see here. Um, what is next? Um, zipping through here. Uh, Edmund says, my dream country, great. Um, Ahmed says, are financials required under the student direct stream? Heck yeah. In fact, Alicia put together a study permit application that was unbelievably solid, rock solid. And um, the person had the $10,000 in this case uh, in, a, in, in the GIC and had paid the tuition, had paid a bunch of other things. And guess what? The application was refused. What are we going to do, you guys? Judicially review. And I know it's going to be successful because the application was full of everything. That's the stage we're at now to, to basically <clears throat> um, prepare the applications in such a fashion that they're so strong that, that, you know, if it goes to court, clearly any refusal would be unreasonable. That's how we approach it. So, <clears throat> heck yeah, financials are required. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Okay, next one here. Um, how high is the chance right now to get PR if you have 420 to 430 points in express entry coming from Germany? Thank you for your work. Um, it really depends. So like I said, provinces like the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program um, still do notifications of interest. And they did back in December when they did a larger one to people that happened to be fit had happened to fit within an occupation and demand area. And so they are still doing um, extending invitation to people in that point range, but through the general express entry FSW route, I don't think you're ever, ever going to get an ITA under the FSW with 420 to 430. It's just, it's just not going to happen. It's not. Okay. Last question. <clears throat> Postgrad. <clears throat> excuse me, postgrad work permit is expiring and no CEC draw is coming. I know, PSJ. This is what we're advocating for. I will let you know the moment I hear anything. We've talked to the minister. I have a submission and I will show you the submission. As soon as we get it sent off, it will be posted on the CBA website and you'll see what we're, we're advocating for. Step one is extend the pilot or extend that one time 18 month. And then step two is our, our recommendations for uh, other solutions like you know, the post-grad um, LMIA that I talked about, um, like potentially revisiting the TR to PR pathway, which, you know, at this stage I and where we're at, um, I'm going to start advocating for a resurgence to the TR to PR pathway. I would love for that program to come up again. All right, we're going to turn on a little bit loud there. Yeah, it is. And I'm going to start up the music. I want to thank all of you guys for tuning in. I have a another meeting right now at 11 so i can't go um any longer than this but thank you guys for tuning in and remember we'll be back tomorrow 11 a.m uh sorry no friday when is it let's go back to the youtube channel and see when it is 
flip it over here, go to home, make sure that you like and that you subscribe and ring the bell notification when, so I'm going live here for Alicia and I. So if you open this up here, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I've got the scratchy throat. <clears throat> It'll give you the option to, um, uh, to click on this. Okay. And to, uh, and to get notified when this goes live. But February the 4th, so it's 11 a.m. on Friday is when Alicia and I are going live. So more questions answered on your way. All right. This is Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher. Wishing you guys all the best as you navigate this crazy world that we call Canadian immigration. Take care, guys.